Alright, go ahead and go to Proverbs tonight. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. And start reading in verse 12. It says, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Sudden he, suddenly he shall be broken without remedy. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Tonight, what I want to talk to you about is, and you might, after hearing this title, you're like, why did I just use this passage? But why do we make a big deal about end times? Okay? I talk a lot about end times here. I'm different than your you know, mainstream Baptist on this issue. And, you know, we make kind of a big deal about it. You know, we take this stuff very serious. And many times, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that are, trying to fight and shut up people like me and, you know, keep us quiet on this stuff and, you know, not doing it. I'm continuing to, you know, push forward on this thing. I think this is something that we need to get right. There is a lot in the Bible about prophecy. And I think it's important. It's important. If it wasn't important, there wouldn't be that much in the Bible about it. And I think when we get these things wrong, there's consequences for it. And many people, when it comes to this, it's like, you know, this isn't, this isn't a big deal. You know, why are you, why are you fighting about it? Why are you causing trouble? And, you know, first of all, I don't think I'm the one causing all the trouble. You know, I'm just trying to preach what I preach, and uh, I'm, I'm not the one having conferences trying to stop, you know, people like me. But at the same time, um, you know, I am continuing to push forward on this, and nobody's giving me a reason to stop at all. In fact... A lot of what's going on has only motivated me even more, and it showed me why this is important. You know, why, you know, who cares if, if they're wrong on end times? It's not that big of a deal, but I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a musical illustration tonight on why it's a big deal and why it's important. Because I'm going to show you what I believe has happened when it comes to this, okay? You'll notice in that passage that we read in verse 14, it said, forwardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. And then he goes on and it talks about, you know, these six, six things that the Lord hate, a seven art abomination. And the last one is he that soweth discord among the brethren. Okay. And discord, it, the definition of it is disagreement among persons or things between persons, differences of opinions, variance, opposition, contention, strife, any disagreement which produces angry passions. Contest, disputes, litigation, or war. Discord may exist between families, parties, and nations. Another definition is disagreement, one of order, a clashing. Okay? And a lot of people say, well, you're the one sowing discord. You know, you're the one that's off. You're the one that's a little different than everybody else. But I want the third definition that you'll see in the Webster's 1828 dictionary, notice it says in music, disagreement of sounds. Okay? Uh, a union of sounds which is inharmonious, grating and disagreeable to the ear, or an interval whose extremes do not coalesce. Thus, the second and seventh, when sounded together, make a discord. So this, the term discord is applied to each of the two sounds which form the dissonance and to the interval, but more properly to the mixed sound of dissonant tones. It is opposed to concord and harmony. Okay, Now, if you're not a musician... That might not have made a whole lot of sense to you. But in music, okay, you have many times multiple sounds that all come together and it forms a harmony. And it sounds good. And so I want to illustrate this with you. You know, my instrument's a guitar. That, you know, that's, uh, that's what I play. Uh, a lot of this would be, uh, there's other instruments you could do this on. But I'm going I'm to show you on a guitar, okay? So on a, on a guitar you have chords that you play all right so i'm going to strum all strings together you hear that and it makes i think a nice sound okay i'm playing several different notes there's six strings in a guitar i've got six notes that i'm playing at one time okay 
And that's, that's a chord. It sounds good when played all together, but it's got to be in tune, all right? And so what I'm going to do tonight, I want to show you something on, on the guitar. We have the piano over there. We've got my wife on the piano. I want you to think of that piano. It represents the Word of God, okay? The piano represents the Bible. Now, what I did before service, I tuned my guitar to the piano. I wanted my guitar to sound right with the piano, okay? And this guitar, this represents the doctrine that I preach, okay? Y'all get that? And our doctrine is supposed to line up with the Bible, doesn't it? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make our doctrine line up with the Bible. That's what God has uh, told us to do. So the piano represents the Word of God. So now I'm going to play a song for you with the piano, and let's and you'll hear how it goes together. All right, go ahead and start. All right, so, okay, we'll stop right there. So here it goes together, right? Because my doctrine, you could say, is in tune with the Word of God. Now, here's the thing. You could say each one of these strings represents a different, uh, you know, area of doctrine, okay? So, uh, you know, what I'm talking about specifically tonight, you know, why the prophecy stuff's a big deal. Why... You know, the, the, and the pre-trib doctrine, it is a sacred cow in most churches. I mean, if you don't, if you're not pre-trib, you know, they're not going to have anything to do with you. You have to be on board with that. And, you know, the thing is, the, the people that have ruined this, it's the prophecy evangelist, okay? These guys who they focus on one area of doctrine, and that's all they preach on. They go around, they might preach 10 different sermons a year. Literally, that's all they preach. And they're focusing. You can say it's like they're playing on one string. And if it's just one string by itself, it sounds fine. You can't tell if it's not in tune. And the problem is, when you focus on just one doctrine, many times you can get off and you don't realize it. Okay, so I'm going to show you something here. We're going to say all these strings represent different areas of doctrine. But let's say I decide, you know what? Something's not sounding right. With when it comes to the pre-trib. I believe when it comes to the pre-trib doctrine, they've got one string that's out of tune. Now, does that sound bad by itself? That doesn't sound bad by itself. It sounds pretty good. But now, I'm going to do some chords when I have one string out of tune on my guitar. How does that sound? Alright. Doesn't that sound terrible? I've only got one thing wrong. And see, when it comes to the pre-trib doctrine, I, I think it sounds terrible with the rest of the Bible. It doesn't fit. And so what it, people are doing because they're scared to get off, instead of fixing their doctrine, you know what they do? All right, I can't change this string. If I change this string, I'm kicked out of the club. It doesn't sound bad by itself, so here's what I'll do. I will adjust my other strings to fit with this one. All right? So, I'm going to tune it. All right, so it's, it's hard to do this while talking at the same time. But if I, so if I tune my strings, listen to this. This is hard to do, talking at the same time. Let's see. All right, I'll just do, I won't do all of them, all right? See how these ones sound fine together now? All right, that sounds good now. I've tuned my other strings to fit with the pre-trip. But now, let's start playing with the Word of God again, all right? Now, let's listen to that sounds. Ready? Hear that? It sounds terrible. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? Now, if I'm by myself, it sounds fine. You know, if I'm a prophecy evangelist and I'm going around, I don't have that tune together perfectly. I can't do it here in front of everybody. But it sounds fine by itself. But then when you match it up with the Word of God, now we have a clash. And I'm going to show you tonight what I believe getting fixated on this pre-trib doctrine has done 
to other people's doctrine. Because instead of just fixing that, what they have done is they've started changing the other doctrines too. That's what's happened. And that's why this is a big deal, folks. That's why we care about this stuff and we make such a big deal. And so it is. It's a sacred cow. People just refuse to let go of it. And so I can't, I'll, you know, after I've retuned my guitar to fit with that pre-trib, that guitar then that sounds good by itself but clashes with the piano or the Word of God, I call that the dispensa it's dispensationalism. Now, that's what dispensationalism is. Dispensationalism is a doctrine that they came up with to basically make pre-trib sound harmonious. But once again, if, uh, if you're going to buy into dispensationalism, you don't get to use the whole Bible. And on the guitar too, you know, there's a lot of things I could do. Sometimes if you have a string that's bad, you can avoid that string. You know, I could get up and I could play some songs and I could just avoid that string and you might not notice. Okay. But, and that's what people are doing when it comes to people who are off on these subjects, there's things in the Bible that they are going to have to avoid. And we're not supposed to avoid anything. We're supposed to teach all things. You know, we're supposed to teach the whole counsel of God. And so, you know, what is it that this teaching has produced? Well, first of all, it's made a large part of the Bible very confusing. I mean, back before I got my head screwed on straight in this subject, Matthew 24 just would give me a headache like you would not believe because I'm reading it, trying to make it fit a pre-trib doctrine. And you know, what's funny. I heard a preacher the other day, you know, he's talking about, you know, how is it that all these great preachers harmoniously have come up with the pre-trib doctrine? But here's the thing, their doc, their pre-trib doctrine doesn't harmonize together at all. You know, there's three different, there's three guys that I know per, that I know that in this area are the big, you know, prophecy guys that go around preaching prophecy. All of them are pre-trib. All of them are pro-Jew. And you got Sam Gipp, when he preaches in Matthew 24, he has, you know, the wars, the rumors of wars and all that. He has all that as the tribulation, which I would agree. But then when the rapture comes after the tribulation, he says, that's not our rapture. That's a rapture for the Jews. All right, that's really weird. But the thing is, Nobody gets mad at him for it because he's pre-trib and he's pro-Jew at the end of the day. And then you have guys like Brian Sharp that I grew up listening to. He teaches that in the wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, that that's all now. That, you know, we've, that we're going through all that now and that the rapture that we see after the tribulation of those days in Matthew 24, he says is our rapture. Do you realize how different those two opinions are? Sam Gibbs hyper dispensational. Brian or Brian Sharp is anti dispensational. They were preaching at the same meeting recently, and Brian Sharp got up and he gave a lecture. I didn't get to stay and see it. I wanted to see it so bad, and he was just—I mean—he's attacking dispensationalism. And I say, good for him. You know, I'm like, I was wanting to be there and to cheer him on. You know, but at the same and, and right now, amongst the pre-trib camp. You know, there's some friction going on because they don't agree at all. There is no harmony there. And, you know, and then another guy, Charles Hiltabittle, he's another guy, you know, good guy, nice guy. But, you know, he's when, when he gets to Matthew 24, I was listening to him talk about the other day. He has those wars, rumors, wars and all that. He says, you know, that's now he has the tribute or the rapture that's in Matthew 24 is our rapture. But then he's dispensational. And so it's like, I mean, those are three completely different ways to look at everything. But in the end, they all buckle. And if they all say those, you know, two magic titles of pre-trib and pro-Jew, they're in the club. Even though there's no harmony there whatsoever. And so people like me, when I was younger and I would listen to all these people, I'm confused out of my mind. So is that first part of Matthew 24, the tribulation, or is it not the tribulation? You know, is that our rapture in Matthew 24, or is that the Jews rapture? And what are the Jews getting a separate rapture for? You know, it made it very confusing. You know, the, the amount of double talk that goes on in there, it, it just, it, it would drive you, drive me crazy. And so, you know, the pre-tribbers, they would say what we teach is confusing. You know, the pre-tribbers could take that same illustration I used and they could throw it at us too. 
But I'm going to show you how you can know which one's right, and that is which group preaches more of the Bible. It, because you're going to notice in this other camp, they have a very limited amount of subject matter that they cover. And it's pretty shallow. And there is, there's a lot of Bible they don't avoid, why, why, or that they will avoid. Why is it that I, I cannot, for the life of me, I cannot get any one of these people to try to preach on and even touch 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I can't get them to touch with the 10 foot pole. It's like you got that one string out of tune. It sounds terrible. It's killing the music. And so you do, you just have to try to avoid that. And 2 Thessalonians 2, it kills their teaching. And they won't, they won't touch on it. Look what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Okay? I believe that's a rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way and when that wicked shall be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. I cannot get these people to touch 2 Thessalonians 2 with a 10-foot pole. They, they won't mention it. Why do they have to avoid that? Because their doctrine, okay? Remember, my, my guitar that's in tune with itself but it's not in tune with the word of God. It's going to clash big time. And this chapter, it clashes. And so the way you tell whose doctrine is true is, you know, who is using the entire Bible? Who is it that runs screaming from passages? You know, why is it that you can't, that a lot of these churches, their preachers, they won't preach, you know, through entire books of Bibles and through chapters. It's a pull a verse here and there, and then they just start ranting from there on out. It's like, you know, because with the guitar and with music, you know, you can play those notes that are out of tune. But the thing is, when it comes to music, you know, you kind of forget that sound. You know what I'm saying? You know, you forget exactly. And, but it's when you match it up with other things at the same time, that's when you start noticing the clashing. And if these people use too much Bible in their preaching, things are going to start sounding sour. Things aren't going to work. And so they do. They barely use any scripture. When I first started coming around in this subject, I did. I, I got my hands on every message I could from these people. Just trying, you know, you guys, somebody's got to answer my questions. Somebody's got to show me why 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 has the coming of Christ after the abomination of desolation. And you can't say, they keep saying, you know, these people, they can't understand, you know, the rapture from the second advent, you know, the, the you know, glorious appearing, which is Armageddon. They can't understand that. But no, listen, I get the differences between those two things. But it says in there, it's talking, when it talks about the coming, it's not talking about the second advent, as they call it, or Armageddon. It's talking about our gathering together. And it said that that's not going to come until after the man of sin is revealed, which is in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. And they don't bring that up. They just, you know, they, they just ignore this. Just completely ignore it. And I would, I would listen to these people preach messages. I would listen to hour-long messages and literally hear like four or five scriptures used. And these people, they want to bash my preaching on that where I'll use dozens and dozens of scriptures showing how everything fits together. I'll show how Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'll show how the events all line up perfectly. And you know, they, they, they use two verses. Going to come as a thief in the night. Proves eminence. There, that's it. That's all I need. And, you know, I mean, that's all they'll do. And that, that's not fair. You know, why won't these, so why won't they read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Listen, when I'm preaching on a false doctrine, the first thing I try to do is I try to find out what scriptures they use to prove their point. 
And then you know what scriptures I use? They're scriptures. And I show where they are wrong. Okay? That's what I do. I use their scriptures. And so if you're trying to stop you know, people from following this you know, post-trib doctrine, why wouldn't you use the scriptures that they use? Wouldn't that be, that would be, those would be the first scriptures I would go to, but they don't bring them up. I mean, I listened to 13 hours of a guy trying to disprove what we teach, and he never, never went to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Why not? Because we would have heard a twang in his cord that just, I mean, hurt our ears. Everybody would be like, whoa, something's wrong. And even though, even if you're not musical here and you don't understand guitar well, you know, when, when I started playing that again, you heard something bad, didn't you? You knew something's wrong. You might be, and you know, if you're somebody with like perfect pitch, you might be able to figure out what's wrong and hear that. Most people can't do that. But even if you're not musical, you know when something's wrong. And you know what? When you're a Christian, you might not know everything about the Bible. You might not be the biggest scholar in the world, but you can tell when something's off. And, you know, because there, there's, just some, there's something inside of you and it, that's not fitting. And instead, what people are doing, they're changing everything else. Why won't these people read the rest of First Thessalonians or read the rest of First Thessalonians five after chanting the thief of the night? It is. It's like, you no, know, it's coming as a thief of the night, thief of the night. You know, they'll plug their ears. You know, they don't want to say it's thief of the night, thief of the night. Just say it over and over again. And it's like, all right, go to First Thessalonians chapter five. Look what it says. They do, they just want a thief of the night, thief of the night. It's imminent, it's imminent. He's coming as a thief of the night. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, But at the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Right there, perfect. You know, that is proof of a pre-tribulation rapture, because the rapture is imminent. He's coming as a thief in the night. He could come any time. He could come today. Thief in the night. Thief in the night. I had somebody doing that the other day. I'm trying to explain this to them. And they're like, no, thief in the night. Thief. And I said, listen, slow down for a second. He's coming as a thief in the night. That's absolutely true. But let's keep reading. Verse 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of the light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So wait a minute. He's coming as a thief in the night? Yeah. But on them, not on us. We're not in darkness. That day is not going to overtake us as a thief. But wait a minute. So how, if it's not going to overtake us as a thief, does that mean we're going to see it coming? I think it has to mean that. You know, why won't they admit the double talk? That, I mean, that is, that is amazing double talk. Saying that we're supposed to watch while there's nothing to watch for. No, what I say unto you, I say unto you all watch. It means he can come at any time. No, he, he's telling us to watch for the signs, for the things he told us was going to come first. He's not just saying, watch him. Well, I'm just going to look up here and just, just wait. You know, if he's going to come as a thief in the night on us, okay, a thief who's, you know, he doesn't tell you that he's coming, right? Because he, does, he doesn't want you to know it. Okay? But... God's not coming on us as a thief. He has told us what to watch for. He's not trying to surprise us. Therefore, he has given us things to watch for, things that we are supposed to see. Do you see how, how much double talk there is there? And then they say, no, the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. Well, okay. Well, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. That's the sixth seal in Revelation. That's what we see in Matthew chapter 24. So, oh, the day of the Lord is not necessarily the rapture. The day of the Lord encompasses many things. You know, it, it, it encompasses all these, you know, all these things, you know, the rapture and the tribulation and, you know, the second coming and the, everything being burned up by fire. But wait a minute. You're the one saying, you know, the day of the Lord is coming as deep in the night. The day of the Lord is coming as deep in the night. You know, proof, you know, that it's imminent. The Bible says that the sun will be turned to darkness before the day of the Lord comes. Therefore, yeah, even if the day of the Lord encompasses a bunch of things, 
the tribulation has to happen first because the sun's turned to darkness and moon to blood before. So you can have it encompass a thousand years if you want, but the tribulation still has to happen before the day of the Lord come. Nobody wants to stop and think about this. And I will, I'll, I'll, t- I'll take these people through this slowly. You know, look, this is, l- listen to what you're saying. Listen to what you just told me. You're telling me proof of imminency is the thief of the night, and then I'll show them these things. You know, I'll, I'll tell you that the ra- I say the rapture comes after the tribulation, and then no, you want to see the day of the Lord comes the thief of the night, and then I will show in the Bible where the sun is turned to darkness and moon to blood before the day of the Lord. And they do, they just, they don't see it. Because they've never actually, none of these people that are trying to disprove this, they've never actually sat down and studied this. They've not heard any of us out. They, they've not done that. They just hear it, they don't like it, and then they just run with it. And they listen to people that are out there that misrepresent what we teach, and they run with what they're saying because they like what they're saying. And that's not right. And they're making themselves look like fools. Revelation chapter 3 verse 3 says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. Y'all see that right there? Now that was a warning. God said, If you will not watch, he'll come on you as a thief and you will not know what hour. So, what does that mean if we do watch? It means he won't come as a thief and we will know the hour? Uh-oh, you, I shot myself in the foot, didn't I? No man knoweth the day or the hour. No man knoweth the day or the hour right there. You don't want to bring that one up because that proves an imminent return of Christ. No man knoweth the day or the hour. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And you know what? I don't know the day or the hour. Nobody knows the day or the hour right now. Everybody's always accusing us of setting dates for the rapture. I don't, I've never set a date for the rapture. I have no idea when the rapture is going to come. But is, is it saying there that no man will ever know the hour? Listen, when it starts happening, we're going to know. Right now we don't know because we're not in that time right now. But listen, if we're supposed to watch so he won't come on us as a thief then that means we will have to know, if we are watching, we will know when it's about to happen. And then the th- great thing about this too, of that day and hour, no man. Well, what, then that what they'll do is, that's in Matthew 24, where it's talking about the rapture, that we say is our rapture, but then they'll say, they tr- the same people that use that verse try to say that that's not our rapture in Matthew chapter 24. Well then, no man knows the day or the hour. That's not for us. That's for the Jews. You know, no man knows the day or the hour of the Jews' rapture. Not ours. Do you see the double talk? Do you see how there is no harmony there? Folks, this is, this is ridiculous. And it's insulting. And one of the reasons that this is a big deal is this pre-trib doctrine, it has forced people to, I mean, mangle the Scriptures. I mean, literally deny clear Scriptures. They've made it confusing. They have made it confusing. Not us. You know, people who believe like we do on this, I mean, we're pretty much in agreement. In the whole crowd, the, you know, the, there's really only one variation. You have the, like the Kent Hoven group that they just have uh, a little slight difference in the timeline. You know, and I'm not going to go into that. It's not a huge difference, really. Uh, but you know, it's everybody's pretty much the same on this across the board in how they teach. But boy, not in the pre-trib world because it's it's just so wrong and they can't make it fit. And so this attempt to cover up the truth about a post-trib rapture is caused preachers to accept other things that I think are far worse and even easier to disprove. And that is the new doctrine. When I say new, I mean in the last hundred and some years, this new doctrine of Zionism. Listen, that is a, it is a very wicked doctrine. See, preachers, they couldn't explain who the saints were that we see in Daniel and Revelation that's being persecuted by the Antichrist. You know, how could all the saints get raptured and then you've got the Antichrist persecuting the saints? Where, where did these saints all come from? Well, those are Jews. 
which makes no sense since they don't believe in Christ. And then, you know, they got the whole thing with the 144,000 that's goofy. Don't have a lot of time to go into that. But listen, you know, you listen to what they say about, the, I teach about the 144,000. I talked to somebody about this the other day. They started talking about the 144,000 Jews that were going to go and evangelize the whole world. And I said, I said, where do you see that in the Bible? So where do you see those 144,000 Jews evangelizing the world? Where, where does the Bible say that? They had no idea. And I said, well, let me help you. I will show you where the, I'll, I'll tell you where the Bible says that. And I, I, I don't have the passage up here, but in, I went to the passage in Daniel where it talks that about they that do know the Lord will be strong and do exploits. Does that saying evangelizing the world? That's not what that says. You know, that's not super, super clear, is it? Okay? Now, I've got my interpretation. I I do think that when all of it starts going down, I believe that's talking about us during the tribulation. You know, I think think we'll probably accomplish some things during that time. I think there's going to be a lot of soul winning going on during that time. Persecution is one of the biggest motivators for Christians. I mean, whenever Christians have been under persecution, that's when there's been some of the greatest revivals. And so, uh, you know, I, I think I do think that's for us. But once again, that's not necessarily that doesn't necessarily prove 140. Does it say anything about 144,000 Jews in there? Okay. Now, okay, is it possible? All right. Well, I'll, I'll give you that. Okay, it's a possibility, but that is not real clear, is it? That's not real clear, but I, I, I told him, I said, listen, that's all there is in the Bible. You see that 144,000? It never says in Revelation they're evangelizing the world. That comes from Daniel. They do know the Lord will be strong to do exploits. That's not real clear. So when it comes to this whole thing of Zionism, you know, why is it, you know, who is it that's using more of the Bible once again? And preachers, you know, they couldn't explain who those saints were that we see. So they decided that they were the physical seed of Abraham or the Jews. Now turn over to Ephesians chapter 2 because I'm going to show you some passages. And listen, I'm, I'm preaching this too. I, I want my friends that are out there that are on the other side of this issue. I wish they would listen to this. I wish they would uh, look at these scriptures. And I wish they would preach messages using these scriptures. I, you should, it, listen, if you're right, you shouldn't have to avoid any scripture. But they do. You, ne- you will never hear in any of these pre-trib pro churches them preaching on this. They might read through it out of obligation. Sometimes they'll just read through passages and they don't expound on it. They will never read through these things, say this is what you know, the post-tribbers, you know, the replacement theology people teach and accurately represent it and then show what the truth is. They won't do that. And look what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. After the famous for by grace he is saved passage. Everybody knows that. But then in verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at the time ye are without Christ, being aliens from, from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were far off, and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access. Both. Who who is this both? All right? The Jews and the Gentiles. You know, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Fellow citizens with the saints and with the household of God. You know, we are, we are with them now and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the building fitly framed together growth into an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Why won't they talk about that passage? 
Why won't they show how God broke down that middle wall? How he abolished those things, those laws? Why won't they read all those passages? We're in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Male nor female. All the, they, they don't touch on those things. They still, they make it like the Old Covenant. The Old Testament is still alive and still well, or that it's going to come back. And I'm going to show you in a little bit that that is not the case. The Old Testament is never coming back. The Old Testament economy, what everybody wants to call it all the time. It's not coming back, folks. I'll show you, and you'll see that in a little bit. You know, but why won't they touch these passages? It's because their strings are out of tune. Why won't they? I cannot get any of them to acknowledge Romans chapter 9. These people, they're, they're out there, they're trying to preach against all this stuff. Why won't they touch Romans 9 with a 10 foot pole? I can't even quote these verses to these people without them interrupting me and getting mad. Romans 9 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. Why won't anybody touch that scripture? Why won't they address that and say, you know, those... You know, those anti-Zionist people, those replacement theology people, they take this verse where it says they that are children of the flesh are not the children of God. And they say that those who physically come from Abraham are not the children of God. Why don't they say that? Because people are going to look at that verse and say, but that's what it says. They, they don't, they don't do that. What do they do? They just avoid it. They don't touch it. And what do they do? Genesis 12. Go back to Genesis 12. You know, I'll bless them the blessing and curse them that curse thee. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. And then they don't go to Galatians chapter 3 either. Go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. When did that happen? Genesis chapter 12. And so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed where the promise was made. The Jews, right? The Jews. Those who descend from Abraham. You know, go try to count the Jews. You can't count the Jews. They're like the sand of the sea. Go try to number them. To Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. Talking about the Jews. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Oops. <laughs> Oh, that was just talking about Jesus, wasn't it? Why, why don't they bring that verse up and say, you know, when God said, you know, the, these replacement theology people, they teach when God said, I will bless them, the blessing, curse them, the curse them, and then thy seed. They say that's talking about Jesus Christ. And they use Galatians chapter 3, verse 16 to prove it. They don't do that. Because people will read that and be like, but that's what it says. But listen, if we're wrong. And if your teaching is what lines up with all the Bible, you should be able to use that verse and show us where we're wrong. But they can't do it. There's no way they can do it. Verse 28. For there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What, what, are, you, what are they going to do with that? I'll tell you what they're going to do with that. They're going to avoid it. They're going to avoid it. And you know what else they're going to do? If anybody in their church brings that verse up, they're going to try to run them out of their church, accuse them of being an Andersonite or something, and cause, you know, you know, accusing them of causing problems in their church. It's ridiculous, folks. Listen, there should be no verse in the Bible that preachers are scared to use. We ought to be able to use the whole Bible. And they are, they're intimidating people. And some of these preachers, they're intimidating other preachers. And preachers are scared to death. I mean, they, they're not going to preach in this stuff right now. Because if they study too much, they might find out they're wrong. And if they find out they're wrong, they might have to take a stand. And if they take a stand, they're going to have to deal with some persecution. And why would they have to deal with persecution? You know, we're Christians. We're not appointed under wrath. You know? God promised us easy street until the rapture comes, right? Listen, persecution is not the wrath of God. Tribulation is not the wrath of God. 
We're all going to have, we've always had those things. We always will have those things. And so, uh, Galatians 4.28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We are the children of the promise. We are the chosen people. So, I mean, do you all see how clear this stuff is in the Bible? It's so clear. And to think that somebody would go and preach a two and a half hour message debunking what I just taught and not use these scriptures shows that they are terrified of those scriptures. Listen, if I'm going to preach a message on Calvinism, I'm going to go, I'm going to find all the verses they use. I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter one. I'm going to go to Romans, uh, was it chapter seven with the Jacob have I love? I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to those passages. I'm going to go to their scriptures and I'm going to go after it then. That, that, those, that's where I'm going to go. I'm not going to avoid those scriptures because if I do, all those people that think that way, they're going to be like, what about this verse? Well, I'm going to use those. And if I'm right, I shouldn't be scared of those scriptures. I should be able to take them and show them where they're wrong. But nobody even tries with these. I mean, I, I have read books. I have got books and books on these subjects trying to debunk what I teach and nobody uses those scriptures. Everybody uses Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and then nobody uses Galatians 3 and 4. That, that makes no sense at all. So, in order to cover up the lies of the pre-trib doctrine and Zionism, they came up with dispensationalism that teaches different ways of salvation in the Old Testament and New Testament. And basically, teach also that in the tribulation, we're going to go back to old, the Old Testament economy. See... This is the thing, too. You know, these people, they're always out acting like, you know, we're the one poly parroting people. When we'll use a ton of scripture, we'll quote a whole bunch of scripture and they'll tell us we're parroting people. But then they'll go around saying things like the Old Testament economy. Well, where did you get that term? That term didn't come from the Bible. You got that from another prophecy preacher. You know, and there's no doubt about that. And, and where do you get this from the Bible? They're going to go back to an Old Testament economy where basically there's works again. And look at, look at Hebrews chapter 8. I've proved over and over again where that comes from, the whole works thing, is that he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Which that's not even talking about soul salvation. That's talking about physical salvation. That's talking about your flesh being saved because the Antichrist would be going around killing people. But look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 17 to prove we're never going back to the Old Testament economy. It says, for if that first covenant, okay, the first covenant, the Old Testament, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, A new covenant. He made the first old now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. You all see that? Folks, it went away. It, it disappeared. Jesus, He fulfilled all that old covenant and He made a new covenant, one that makes salvation possible by faith without works. And here's the thing too, when it comes to the salvation by faith without works, that salvation, that New Testament, that blood that Jesus shed on the cross, not only is that what saves us, it's what saved everybody in the Old Testament. Everybody in the Old Testament that got saved and that's in heaven got saved by grace through faith. Every one of them. Hebrews 11 proves that. Hebrews 11 proves that that people got saved in the Old Testament without works, by faith, 
That's what the Bible, that's what the Bible clearly teaches. And so listen, if nobody ever got saved by the old covenant, why would it come back? If it didn't save anybody back then, it's not going to save anybody in the future. And if the new covenant, if the blood of Christ, if faith, you know, faith in him and grace is what saves us in this covenant, it's what saved everybody in the past, which is what Hebrews 11 teaches, then why in the world would it be something different in the future? Listen, the old covenant, it vanished away. It's finished. It was abolished. You know, those ordinances, they were nailed to the cross. It is not coming back. That is a lie. That is a false doctrine. So they can find a way to hang on to these pet doctrines to make sure they don't get kicked out of the club. Listen, if you're an evangelist and you preach what I preach, good luck booking meetings. This is not going to happen. If you're a missionary and you preach what I preach, good luck raising support. Let me tell you, the establishment is strong. The pre-trib mafia is real, folks. They are real. They know how to lean on people. They know how to intimidate people. Listen, I've had friends that have gotten phone calls from these pre-trib mafia people checking up with them because they know these people are friends with me wanting to make sure that, you know, and we'll make sure you all aren't uh, changing. You know, are you all still pre-trib? You're not pre-trib. Uh, we're going to have to break fellowship here. You know, don't be surprised when you find yourself wearing concrete shoes at the bottom of the river. You know what I mean? You know, they, haven't, they haven't gone that far, but they do. They intimidate. And, you know, and sadly, when we've had a, generations of teaching, you're not appointed to wrath. No tribulation for you people. No persecution for you people. We've raised a bunch of wimps. And these preachers, man, they just buckle. And they give in. Oh, no, I'm not pre-trib. Oh, I'm not listening to that, Tommy. He's a heretic. You know, I'm not, I'm not listening to people like that. No, it's, you know, it's sad. It's pathetic. And listen, this dispensationalism, it messes with the truth about salvation. And I'm sorry, that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. You can say, you know what, you believe in the end times isn't a big deal. But the thing is, this thing is so important to them that they literally, in order to hang on to it, are messing with the truth about salvation. And, be, and because preachers have invested so much time and effort into covering their lies for so long, you know, there's a generation that feels like they can't change because they would be spitting in the face of their dead forefathers. That's what, that's what they think. I'd be spitting in the face of my dead, dead forefathers. But let me tell you something. These people that want to keep bringing up dead men. Okay? That's what they're doing. They're bringing up dead men as you know, proof that I'm wrong, that the Bible's wrong, proof that they're right for standing strong. They're bringing up, they're bringing up dead men. But listen, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. What do you mean by that? What are you saying? Matthew 22, verse 31 says, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He's talking to these Sadducees who do not believe in an afterlife. They don't believe in a resurrection. They're like, wait a minute. He's saying, go back to the Old Testament. God, when He was speaking to Moses at the burning bush, He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dead during Moses' time? Physically speaking, yes. But, by, right, Jesus said, God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. They were alive in heaven with God. And do you realize these people that are holding on to false doctrine because of the great men of the past? Do you understand these guys are following dead men in their minds? But listen, I'm not going to follow dead men. I'm going to follow the living God. Because and the God I follow, He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So listen, I understand loyalty to people. But listen, Jack Hiles and Lester Roloff and Oliver B. Green and all these people, they're not dead. They're in heaven. They're alive today. There are people today. I've talked to many people. I talked to a guy here in town who he's Lutheran. His dad was Lutheran. His granddad was Lutheran. They were Lutheran preachers. And even though he knows they're not preaching the truth over there. He can't deny the faith of his fathers. But listen, if his fathers are, were saved, they're not Lutheran anymore. They agree with the Bible now. Listen, I don't care what those guys taught while they were on earth. They're in heaven now, and they now agree with the Bible. And therefore, I believe they would want me to teach this. 
Listen, nobody claims these guys were perfect while on, on this earth. Those guys, while they're on this earth, said they weren't perfect. They said the word of God was perfect. And so if you find something in the Bible that's crystal clear, that's laid out, that's spelled out, and it doesn't line up with what they teach, listen, don't feel bad. They're not dead. You don't need to honor their memory. They're not dead. They're in heaven with God. You know what you need to do? You need to be loyal to them and be loyal to the word of God and change your beliefs and get it right. And who cares if it wasn't what they taught when they were here on this earth? They're not dead, folks. They're in heaven with God. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And people do. Oh, my dad taught this, and so I can't change on this. And you know, my dad's in heaven, and he'd roll over in his grave if he knew. He's not dead, folks. Listen, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. I talk to people all the time, out door knocking. You can't get them to get saved because they're Catholic and their family was Catholic. Their moms and dads were Catholic. Their grandparents were Catholic. But listen, even if your family and your forefathers were lost and are in hell, do you all realize that they would want you to change too? Remember the rich man? I've got five brothers. Send Lazarus back to warn them. And what, what did Abraham say? They have Moses and the prophets. They've got the Word of God. Do you realize no matter what your forefathers' backgrounds were, whether they were saved or lost, they want you to agree with this Bible now. Right now. Who cares what they thought back then? Do you realize they're better now than they were back then? When they were on earth, they were flawed. They weren't, they weren't perfect. Now they're in heaven. They're with God. They're perfect. They know the truth. And right now, they would want you to change. But we do. We've got a whole movement of people out there that are following dead people. They're following the dead. But you know what? I'm following the living. I believe these people are alive. I believe with God. Oh, you, know, you can't know. When they were on earth, they what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches they're in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If they're with the Lord now, they're in agreement with the Lord now. So how do we know if they're right or wrong? From the Scriptures, not their books. And it is. This is it's a dead religion that's being taught out there. And it's being shoved down people's throats. And I'm getting tired of preachers shoving dead guys down my throat. Dead guys that I didn't even know. And... I said, I don't, I don't care what they taught. I know what the Bible says. And either way, whether they're in heaven or hell, they would want me to teach the truth of God. Now, as, as seen in the Bible. So that's a terrible argument. It's time they get rid of they it. They need to find something new. And so Jesus, he was teaching those Sadducees who didn't believe in the afterlife that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were alive. And all these great men, they're alive. They're not dead. And so I'm not going to be loyal to a corpse and worry about it rolling over in the grave. Listen, they're in heaven right now, so I'm loyal to them. And so if your forefathers are saved, they're now perfect like God's word. If they're lost, they want you to change, just like the rich man in hell. And so loyalty, and this loyalty to the pre-trib doctrine, it's loyalty to the dead. Loyalty to dead people. So the final result of accepting all these false doctrines, it takes away faith. Well, what are you talking about? People, you know, they would, they would rather believe men that they can see instead of God's Word. It's not enough for people to just read the Bible and say, you know, that's what the Bible says. I believe that. That's not enough. They've got to have their support group. They've got to have the people surrounding them. They haven't got enough faith to believe at this present moment these men are in heaven and they are no longer flawed. I can't, I can't show you that physically, can I? But the, that's what the Bible teaches, doesn't it? So we're going to have to accept that by faith. They can't do that. They haven't got enough faith to just believe what the Bible says. No, I remember hearing them say that. I remember hearing those words. I remember hearing the preaching. But look what the Bible says. You know, have, have a little bit of faith. Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. See, and this, and I, I talked to somebody the other day too about this, and they kept wanting to bring up their dad and what they taught. And it's like, let God be true and every man a liar. Oh, not my dad. You know, they didn't say that, but it's like, you know, you could, you, it's like they were thinking that. No. Let, oh, you know, I said, like, are we loyal to the word of God or what our parents say? And they brought up that verse in the Bible where Paul talked to Timothy about what you had taught by your mother and by your grandmother. And he told him to continue in those things. 
Okay, so is that teaching that all of us should continue in what our parents and our grandparents taught us? Because what if your grandparents were Catholic and your parents were Catholic? You know, listen, if your parents were right doctrinally, yeah, you ought to follow it. But if they were wrong, let God be true and every man a liar. And it's like, uh, you know, they, people understand that, but there's no way my parents were wrong. There's no way my forefathers were wrong. Let God be true and every man a liar. Uh, except for my family. Listen, nobody's family's perfect, all right? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not tra- getting up here and saying I'm perfect. I'm saying, you know, you can find out by using Scripture. And people aren't doing it. They're avoiding these things. It's easier to trust in a system of men that you can see and where you can surround yourself with that support than standing alone, trusting only in the Word of God. It ta- it's going to take some faith. And a lot of people like forget that. You know, I'm, I'm not going to make waves. I'm not going to cause problems. I'm going to stand by these men. I can see these men. I can trust these men. You know, just what does the Bible say? And, you know, these people, too, they wonder, you know, it's like, you know, the preaching in these churches, it's, it's getting ridiculous. Just the amount of nothing that is said from the pulpit. I mean, it, it's I, I believe God is starting to deal with these places for rejecting his word and not being willing to admit when they're wrong. But it is, it's easier to follow the masses and judge who's right based on circumstances than to trust God even when everything's against you. Those things are all easier. I, I get why they're like that. I'm made out of flesh too. So why is this such a big deal? Because every word of God is pure. Every one of them. And we're not to add or take away from any of it. No one is perfect in their doctrine. But when we find out we are in error, we have an obligation to fix it. And we're, gonna, we are, you know, we're always going to... We should be growing we should always be changing. If we find out we're wrong, you know, then we, we, we need to fix these things. When we learn the truth, there is some responsibility that comes with it. More is expected of us now. And it would be wicked for us to just sit around and not say anything when we know the truth just so we can be popular. Just so we won't make waves. And if we reject this truth, what's going to end up happening? We're going to end up in greater error. Listen, you all aren't going to be able to stand to listen to me play that guitar with that one string out of tune. It's not going to be pleasant. I'm going to start losing people. So I got to do something. I got to start getting those strings to harmonize. Well, I can go however I want, and I can get where that's pretty, but I'm going to have to make sure you all aren't in your Bible. Unless it's in tune with the Word of God. And that's the thing. In most churches today, people aren't reading their Bible regular. Most people in most churches haven't read the Bible cover to cover. They're not studying the Word of God. So that guys, they can get up and they can, they can play their doctrine that's not in tune with the Word of God and most people aren't going to notice it. But if you are, if you're studying the Word, you will, you'll notice these things. Matthew 5.18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so... He shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So, you might not think these things are a big deal, but every word of God is important. And we're going we're gonna to fix these things. We're going to we're gonna teach the truth on it. And because if we don't, I could be the next guy getting up there. Jesus wasn't supposed to be called Jesus. It's supposed to be called Emmanuel. I could be saying some of this goofy stuff that's being said listen i've said plenty of dumb stuff in my life but you know what i'll fix it when i do it i don't want to get stuck in stupid i don't want to get stuck in stubborn and you know, become a heretic i don't want that and if we're not going if we're not willing to submit to the word of god we're going to be in big trouble and so i do i think these things are important and i'm going to keep teaching them so with that let's all stand together